Hi guys, we are going to um, continue on with our book, Louisiana's Way Home. Chapter 12. When I got back to the good night sleep tight, the palm tree curtains were closed and the room was dark and Granny was still in bed. Granny? I said. Mmm, said Granny without moving or removing the covers from her head. Granny, I said in a louder voice. I am very tired, Louisiana, said Granny. I am unwell and baffled and compromised. I would like to sleep. And I said, Well, sleep away. I will be singing at a funeral. And that means we can keep staying in this motel and you can sleep and sleep and sleep. Granny moved the tiniest bit. She said, Do not bother resenting me, Louisiana. I have always put you f first in this world. I am trying to protect you. I am working very, very hard to protect you. It is just that I am so tired. She said all this without taking her head out from under the covers. Her voice was muffled. It was as if she were talking to me from a long, long way away. It was as if she had moved to a different country, a country without teeth. I want to go home, I said. Granny threw the covers off her head. It was the first time I had seen her face to face in what seemed like a long time. She looked different, smaller and less certain. Her mouth was caved in. Her cheeks were flushed. She glared at me. Truthfully, she was somewhat frightened to behold. Louisiana Elefante, she said. We are not going home. I glared at her. She glared at me. I looked away first. I said, I'm hungry. You are always hungry, said Granny in a relieved voice. She put the covers back over her head. Yours is a perpetual and unceasing hunger. Go and find some food. I am working to regain my strength. Do not forget the curse, Louisiana. How could I forget the curse? My great-grandfather sawed my great-grandmother in half on stage in an elf in Elf Ear, Nebraska, and then refused to put her back together again. That is not the kind of thing you forget. It may not be the kind of thing you want to face, but it is also not the kind of thing you forget. I left the room and went and stood in the vestibule of the office of the good night sleep tight. I considered the vending machine. Of course, I was hoping that a boy on, on the roof would show up and offer to get me whatever I wanted, but I was starting to think that maybe I had imagined the boy, just as maybe I had imagined the blue fairy holding out her arms to me the time I almost drowned. Had I imagined the blue fairy? I could not say for certain. Had I imagined the boy? I did not think I had. I knew for a fact I did not imagine the crow named Clarence because he had been sitting on top of the good night sleep type sign when I stepped out of my room. Hello, Clarence, I had shouted at him. He had nodded and looked down at me in a very kingly way. He was probably pleased that I had remembered his name. In any case, the crow was real and the vending machine was real and I stared at it and thought about what I would get if I could get anything I wanted. I could see Bernice inside the office, sitting at her desk. Her hair was in curlers. What a surprise. I waved at her. She pretended not to see me. If the boy showed up and offered to get me whatever I wanted, I decided that I would select a package of peanut butter crackers and a package of crackers with cheese and one of the ballpoint pens so that I could continue to write everything down and also an O. Henry candy bar because I liked the name of them. How upbeat and hopeful they sound. And also because they have caramel in them and peanuts, which is a very good combination. I was thinking all of that when the door to the vestibule opened and there he was, the boy. Hey, he said. Oh my goodness, I was glad to see him. I was glad even beyond the contents of the vending machine. And by that I mean that I liked his face and I was glad he existed, even if he couldn't get me the crackers and the pen and the candy bar. I thought maybe I had made you up, I said to him. No, nah, he said. He stood there, holding the door open, smiling. He nodded in, in the direction of Bernice. She don't like me, he said. Any minute now, she'll be out here with a broom trying to chase me off. Come on. The minute we stepped outside, Clarence came swooping down from the sign and landed on the boy's shoulder. I had never seen such black and shiny feathers. The crow stared at me, and I stared back at him, and looked looking into his eyes was like looking in a dark mirror. I felt that if I looked carefully enough, if I held myself still enough, I would be able to see the whole wide world reflected in that shiny blackness, almost. 
Would he sit on my shoulder? I said. I reckon if he gets to where he trusts you, he would. Clarence flapped his wings and took off, past the sign, toward the trees. What's your name? said the boy. Louisiana, I said. What's yours? Burke. Burke Allen. But I ain't the first Burke Allen. My daddy is Burke Allen, and my grandpop pop is Burke Allen, and his daddy before him was Burke Allen, and his daddy too. There have been a lot of Burke Allens. Well, as far as I know, I am the only Louisiana Elefante. That's lucky then. You ain't got to be nobody but yourself. I said, I have a curse on my head. I don't know why I said it. I shouldn't have said it. Gurney has always insisted that we not talk about the curse to other people. To speak of the curse only intensifies the curse. That is what Granny said. Granny said a lot. For as long as I could remember, Granny had been talking to me, telling me things, and telling me not to tell things. I had never told Rainy about the curse, or Beverly, but here I was telling this boy I did not know at all. Maybe, in addition to being tired of imposing and persevering, I was also tired of keeping my mouth shut. A curse, said Burke. Dang! Yes, I said. It's a curse of sundering. Of what? Sundering. I don't know what that is. It means to tear apart, I said. All right, he said. If you say so. He pointed at the good night sleep tight sign. See that sign? He said. I can climb all the way to the top of that sign. I can show you how to. I'm afraid of heights, I said. Shoo, he said. There ain't nothing to be afraid of. I don't want to fall. You can't fall because... There's little bitty handholds the whole way up. You just got to hold on and climb. I can show you how to climb up on the roof, too. Ain't nothing to it. No, I said. He waited, and I waited. His almost-not-there hair glinted in the sunlight. Why is your hair so short? He shrugged. My mama cuts all our hair. My daddy and grandpap and me, she cuts it all the same. So your mother cuts the hair of Burke Allen and Burke Allen and Burke Allen? He smiled. Yeah, he said, all of us. My parents are dead. They were trapeze artists. In a circus? No, I said. They had their own show. They were famous. They were called the Flying Elefantes. I want to be in a circus, he said. First chance I get, I'm going to join a circus. Circus trains come through here sometimes. You ever seen a circus train? I shook my head. They're all on it. All of them. The whole circus. Elephants and clowns and giraffes and trapeze people. Next time that train comes through here, I am going to hop on it. Can't nobody stop me, he sighed. He looked up at the motel sign. Here he was, right in front of me, and already he was telling me how he was going to leave. It was the curse of sundering. I would never be free. Suddenly, I felt terrified, and also annoyed with Burke Allen. I thought you said you could get me anything I wanted out of the vending machine. I can. Good, I told him. I want the cheese crackers and the peanut butter crackers and an O. Henry bar, and also a pen to write with. He grinned at me. I'll be right back, he said. A few minutes later, he came running out of the office holding two packages of crackers and an O. Henry bar. I didn't get the pen, he said. On account of I didn't have time, Bernice is right behind me, and she ain't happy. Well, Bernice was never happy, was she? Come on, he said. We got to run. I ran with him. We ran into the woods. At some point, Clarence showed up, and he flew over our heads and called and called. He was laughing as if somebody had just told him a joke. Crows have a good sense of humor. I ran with Burke and Clarence, and I forgot about Granny being toothless and diminished. I forgot about Miss Lulu and how badly she played the organ and how she refused to share her car caramels. I forgot that there were no phone listings for Ramey Clark or Beverly Topinski. I forgot that I had to sing at Hazel Elkhorn's funeral. I forgot that I was far from home. I ran. Chapter 13 We set out. We sat out in the woods under a tree, and Clarence perched on one of the branches above us, and his dark feathers shone over us. It was in Elf Ear, Nebraska. In 1910, I said. What was? said Burke. The curse, I said. That is when it all began. I ain't never heard of Elf Ear, Nebraska. It sounds like some made-up place. I am telling you a story that I have never told to anybody else, I said. If you intend to listen to it, you can't doubt everything I say. Otherwise, there is no point in me telling you. I have eaten the entire package of peanuts, peanut butter crackers, and most of the crackers with cheese. I intended to eat the O'Henry bar for dessert. Dang, you was hungry, said Burke. 
I am perpetually hungry. That is what Granny says. I can make you a bologna sandwich if you want, said Burke. My house ain't far from here. Bologna is what they eat in the county home, and the county home is the place of no return. Burke shrugged. I don't know about the county home. Granny has been warning me about the dangers of the county home my whole entire life. Okay, said Burke. All I'm saying is that I can make you a bologna sandwich if you want one, if you're still hungry. Well, I said, I was still hungry. Come on, said Burke. You can tell me about the elf ears later. Elf ear. It's a place. Elf ear, Nebraska. Yeah, he said. Come on, let's go to my house and make a sandwich. I ate the O. Henry bar while I walked behind Burke through the, through the woods. The candy bar was chocolatey and caramely, and it was maybe the sweetest and best thing I had ever eaten in my entire life. I started to feel somewhat hopeful about the universe and my place in it. Even if I was headed off to eat bologna, meat of the county home, food of despair. I love bologna. Burke made me three sandwiches, and I had... They had bologna and orange cheese and mayonnaise, and they were on white bread, and he stacked the sandwiches up one on top of the other and put them on a blue plate, and we sat in the dining room at a glass-topped table and ate the sandwiches one by one without stopping. Granny had always always spoken poorly of bologna, but these bologna sandwiches tasted so good that it was just one more reason for me to doubt Granny and the truth of her utterances. And by that I mean this. If you are the kind of person who lies about something as small as bologna, what would stop you from lying about bigger, more important things? Burke stared at me while I ate. Dang, you can eat a lot. Granny says I need to keep my strength up, I said. That's your granny? That old lady who don't never come out of the room at the good night? Yes, she recently had all her teeth pulled. She is working to regain her strength. Burke nodded. From the glass-topped table in the dining room, I could see over a field and into the woods. It was late afternoon and the light was fading. Sometimes when the light starts to fade, I get a terrible feeling of loneliness, like maybe I am the only person in the world. One time I confessed this to Granny, and she told me that I shouldn't take everything so personally. She said, Louisiana Elefante, the light has been late f fading since the dawn of time, and it will continue fading long after we are gone. It has nothing to do with you. Still, it makes me sad when the light goes. Burke sat across the table from me. There was a sound of the clock ticking, and from outside I could hear a crow calling. Is that Clarence? I said to Burke. Yeah, he said. He gets mad when I'm inside the house for too long. He misses me, I reckon. I am very far from home, I said. Well, all right, said Burke. Where's home? I'm going to tell you the story of the curse, I said. Okay, said Burke. I need to tell you the story. Okay, said Burke. I'm listening. It was in Elf Ear, Nebraska, and the year was 1910, and my granny was eight years old, and her father was the most elegant and deceitful man, a uh, magician, who ever lived. Your granddaddy was a magician, said Burke. My great-grandfather, I said, and my great-grandmother, my granny's mother, was the magician's assistant. They traveled all over the country. They performed magic together. It was like being in a circus, said Burke. It was like being in a magic act, I said. But what matters is that I'm telling you about the curse. And the curse began on a stage in Elf Ear, Nebraska. My great-grandfather pulled my great-grandmother out of a hat, a small hat. He made her appear, and then he made her disappear back into the hat, just like a rabbit. Burke was staring at me, listening. He had very blue eyes. What happened next, he said. What, happens, what happened next was that my... Great-grandfather uttered the fateful words, I will now saw my lovely wife in half and put her back together again, for I am Hiram Elefante the Great. That was his name? Hiram Elefante the Great? What kind of name is that? It was his name, I said. The important thing is that the magician's assistant climbed into the box, and Hiram Elefante nailed the box shut. And then he took a saw, and he sawed the box in half with my great-grandmother in it. She was cut in two, sundered. Do you understand? Burke nodded. Yeah, he said. It was a magic trick. He sawed her in half, and then he put her back together. Well, that is what the audience thought would happen. That is what everyone anticipated, but it was not what happened. I stared at Burke, and he stared at me. Well, he said, what happened? My great-grandfather father sawed my great-grandmother in half, and then he walked away, 
and left my great-grandmother on the stage. Sawed in two. He walked out of the theater and elf ear, and he kept walking. No one ever saw him again. But what about your great-granny? Someone else put her back together. A man from the audience who knew some magic. And then the two of them ran away together, and my granny was left entirely alone. Dang, said Burke. Is this a true story? Of course it's true. What happened to your granny? She got sent to the county home, to an orphanage. And that is the story of the curse of the Sundering, and how it, it has passed down through generations. And now that curse is on my head. Well, said Burke, what you got to do is undo this curse, right? That's what I would do. Undo it, I said. How would I do that? I don't know. There's got to be a way. Maybe what you do is you go and find you another magician to work some magic different. Magic. Magic that puts things back together. Outside somewhere, Clarence called out. Burke and I sat there and stared at each other. And even though I was filled with crackers and bologna and an O. Henry bar, I felt empty and sad. Could the curse really be undone? I doubted it. I don't think Burke Allen fully comprehended the depth and breadth of the curse upon my head. I suppose I should go back and check on Granny, I said. Maybe she is hungry. Maybe you could make her a bologna sandwich. All right, said Burke. I didn't know if Granny would eat a bologna sandwich. In fact, a bologna sandwich might enga enrage her. Maybe I was hoping to enrage her. I don't know. But in any case, Burke went into the kitchen and came back out a minute later with two bologna sandwiches wrapped up in a paper towel. I was starting to see what kind of person he was. He was the kind of person who, if you asked him for one of something, he gave you two instead. We went back outside and stood in front of Burke's house, which was painted as pink as cotton candy on the outside. It was all by itself in the woods, with no other houses nearby. Burke whistled and Clarence came flying out of the woods and landed on Burke's shoulder. And I thought to myself that my life would never be truly complete until I could whistle and have a crow come flying out of the trees directly to me. There's going to be a carnival at the church on Saturday, said Burke. A carnival ain't a circus, but it's still something. And it is mostly fun. There's rides and games. Oh, I said. You and me could go. I need to know something, I said. This is important. What direction is south from here? Burke pointed without even having to stop and consider. It was very impressive. That way, he said. Why? He turned and looked south. Clarence raised his wings and lowered them, but he stayed on Burke's shoulder. Why? said Burke again. Because south is where Florida is, I said. So? said Burke. Florida is where I am from. That's where my friends are. That's where Archie the cat is. That's where Buddy the dog is. And that is where I need to get back to. How do you aim to get there? I don't know, I said. I will figure out a way. I am wily and resourceful, according to Granny. We started to walk back to the good night's sleep tight. Clarence flew ahead of us, stopping to wait on tree branch branches, looking down at us and laughing and laughing. Maybe crows are right about the world. Maybe everything is funny. Chapter 14 Speaking of funny, when I walked into room 102 of the good night sleep tight and said, Granny, I have brought you two bologna sandwiches, Granny did not say anything at all. I expected her to curse the very existence of bologna. Or to tell me she was not hungry, but Granny said nothing. Granny, I said. I went over to the bed, pulled back the covers. Granny was not there. I have never been so surprised in my life. Granny, I said in a very loud voice. I looked in the bathroom. I looked under the bed. And then I ran out of room 102 and looked for the car. And guess what? It was gone. I went back into the room and saw that Granny's plaid suitcase was not on her luggage rack. I felt dizzy. The whole room was spinning. I couldn't breathe. Where would Granny go without me? I was the reason for her existence. She had told me so many times. She said that what kept her alive was looking out for me and teaching me to make the most of my gifts. I bent over and put my hands on my knees. I took deep breaths. I looked around the spinning room. And that is when I saw it, an envelope with my name on it. Inside the envelope, there were several folded up pieces of paper. I unfolded them very, very slowly. Dear Louisiana, those were the words written at the top of the first page. It was a letter. Granny had written me a letter. She had never before written me a letter. And why in the world would she write me a letter? From the very first minute of my life that I could recall, Granny was with me and I was with her. 
Why would you write someone a letter when you were always and forever by their side? You wouldn't, unless, of course, you intended not, intended not to be by their side anymore. I opened the palm tree curtains and sat down on the bed and stared out the window. I heard a rustling. Was it wings? Was Clarence the crow somewhere nearby? Had he come to save me? And then, my goodness, I realized that the rustling was the letter. My hand was trembling, and the pages of the letter were brushed up against each other. It was at this point that I understood that a tragedy was in the process of occurring. The sky outside the window of the good night sleep tight was blue-black, and the curtains had palm trees instead of peaches, and Granny was gone, and I could feel the world whizzing past me. I once had a teacher named Mrs. McGregor, who s said that the world was turning very slowly, slowly on its axis. It is moving infinitesimally, said Mrs. McGregor. Infinitesimally, she said. In the, she said the word very slowly. She stretched it out infinitesimally, so that you could hear infinite in the word when she said it. Mrs. McGregor always had dried spit in the corner of her mouth. But she was a very patient woman, and she was a truthful person. I liked Mrs. McGregor. I could not imagine her telling me a lie. But here is the thing. It did not feel to me like the earth was moving infinitesimally. It felt like it was hur hurtling and jerking its way through a lonely darkness. To my way of thinking, you never knew when the earth was going to lurch and go somewhere entirely unexpected. There was nothing infinitesimal about it. I guess that is what the curse of sundering will do to you if it has been placed upon your head. It will change how the earth itself moves. Oh, Ramy and Beverly. Oh, Archie and Buddy. Oh, Granny. I looked down at the letter in my trembling hands. I started to read. And next time, we'll find out what the letter says in the discussion below. What I want you guys to think about and talk about today is after Louisiana gets to know Burke Allen better, she realizes he is the kind of person who, if you asked him for one of something, he gave you two instead. What does that tell you about him? What does that tell you about him as a character?